Greetings, I'm Solid Scully, and welcome back to Resident Evil Code Veronica. Uh, yeah, there's pretty much nothing more we can do for Steve, and again, if you try and interact with him, Claire basically says I should probably leave him alone. Which, I mean, considering the fact that he pretty much had to kill his zombified father, uh, yeah. Let's, let's cut the kid a little bit of slack, but in the meantime, we don't really have much to do around here anymore, so, uh, we got stuff to do in the city. So yeah, this is pretty much uh, prompting you to explore the rest of the military facility because uh, as of either right now or a little bit later, we're going to be getting an indigo card or a silver card or basically stuff that lets us access the rest of the facility and of course, we'll bypass the bullshit lockdown thing that was affecting the military base. It's all going to be fun on the bunk, kids, so let's have a little explore around. It is also important to note, however, particularly in rooms like this, again, while there are certain puzzles for Claire to solve, like, well, aside from the military proof right there, the, uh, you know, the room not being quite as it seems. Anyway, the salient point I was trying to get at here was that basically there are some puzzles that uh, Claire is specifically going to solve on Rockford Island, and there are puzzles that are very specific to Chris. So some things that Claire solves, Chris is pretty much going to have to pick up the slack, and, uh, in a way, that does kind of solve one of the problems I had with Resident Evil 2. I think I brought it up in the commentary, but uh, in regards to the zapping mechanic, where everything felt a little bit static and never quite matched up depending on what scenario you played first before the other. But again, since Code Veronica is a very linear experience, it is able to adequately, you know, account for changes or, you know, what Claire did versus what Chris is going to do. And again, like, I mean, if there's any point of praise and give for Code Veronica, it does legitimately feel like it was trying to improve over Resident Evil 2's design. I mean, obviously, as I mentioned in uh, Part 3, there are a lot of uh, rough-cut areas, which, again, I don't know is either a factor of uh, the Code Veronica team lacking manpower, or if it was maybe uh, some of Sega's development members of staff not really knowing how to accommodate for a Resident Evil game. Since I think... I'm trying to remember. I think the only sort of survival horror thing Sega really had their hand in at this point, uh, if even that, I think was like uh, Deep Fear, or possibly um, possibly uh, Blue Stinger, if you could stretch the definition. But uh, yeah, putting all that aside, I don't know. There's there's just a lot of elements about Code Veronica's design that uh, kind of feel like they take cues from Resident Evil Two and Resident Evil One, and just sort of well improve upon that. I don't know, like, I mean, and I guess it benefits from that design in the long run, because it seems to have a little bit more of the horror vibe to it, whereas Resident Evil 3 really tended to double down on the action side of things, which again, isn't necessarily a bad thing, because it's all about the perspective of horror that the game is, you know, trying to put forward towards the player. I mean, in the case of Nemesis, it's more of the tangible, there's this giant, big hulking monster coming to kill me, whereas in Code Veronica, Again, it aims similar philosophies of, you know, exploration, uh, being hunted down but down by this very creepy dude. But at the same time, though, it plays it very uh, operatic, and at the same time also very creepy, which, again, gives this game a very unique atmosphere, and again, as you're gonna be hearing me repeat a lot throughout this commentary, is something that just gets under my skin and I can't help but love, man. But yeah, up until we get the Indigo card, there's nothing we can do until the lockdown ends, and uh... Yeah, so it's pretty much time to, well, unlock all the doors that Alfred had pretty much shut down beforehand, and basically undo his dastardly spell. <laughs> I can't hit the high notes, but, uh... <laughs> I mean, I actually have been speculating on part of the reason why Alfred is able to hit those high notes, but, uh, I mean, in terms of, like, the realistic context with his voice actor and everything... I wonder if he did any more voice work, because, I mean, if he was capable of Alfred Ashford, goddamn, I'd love to hear him in more roles like that. Oh god, I just remembered something actually from uh, the Chris's scenario where this puzzle becomes a whole lot more of a pain in the buttocks. PAIN IN the BUTT! But yeah, with the Indigo card, we, it pretty much get, allows us to gain access to the rest of the facility. I mean, the Silver card allows you to access, well, the Silver card reader, obviously. And uh, the Indigo card pretty much lets us access uh, the other doors. A lot of them are mainly within uh, Steve's pathway that, you know, you saw him go through when he was clearing out the area for Claire. So again, it's pretty much just spelunking and opening doors and basically just giving us ease of access. 
I will uh, admit that, th that this can be seen as a little bit tedious, but again, there are a fair few items and supplies along the way. So again, if you didn't pick them up as uh, Claire or the ones that you couldn't pick up as Steve, you can pretty much pick up and at least have some reason to invest your time in trying to get all of these items and make sure that you're ready for the journey ahead. And I suppose now that I mentioned it, the Golugas actually, um, I think this is something that's you, something that you're also meant to do during Chris's scenario, but uh, make sure that you leave the Lugas uh, in the item box, or at least up to the point where you don't really need them anymore, because when you do that, that's pretty much how you unlock uh, Steve Burnside in battle mode. Which I suppose if I could talk about during this lengthy commute around Rockford Island, yeah, the battle mode is something pretty synonymous with um, actually most Sega releases of... Uh, yeah, Resident Evil games, at least for the classic days, because uh, the Sega Saturn version of Resident Evil 1 had a battle mode, I th yeah, Resident Evil 2 also had one, and, uh, well, 3 had the Mercenaries mode, which was pretty much its uh, spiritual successor, for the lack of a better phrase. But yeah, in Code Veronica's case, it pretty much, it, it's pretty much like an arcade kill zombies mode, and uh, uh, one of the few things with Code Veronica specifically is that it allows you to switch between a uh, third-person or uh, first-person mode, which makes it feel very much like Resident Evil Survivor in that aspect. I don't know, it's quite weird. I mean, uh, for those of you expecting, is that, oh, it could be like Resident Evil 7, except like several years early. Uh, no, because it is quite clunky and it feels more like Resident Evil fucking dead aim more than it does uh, anything else. This series clearly wasn't programmed for uh, first-person action, as much as the original concept of Resident Evil 1 would lead you to believe. But in any case, that's just a little bit of trivia here. Again, you can play as Claire, Chris, and uh, Steve, and uh, that's pretty much all she wrote. But of course, enough waffling about that, because now we get something even better. We got the grenade launcher. This is pretty much going to be your heavy enemy buster slash boss buster for the time being. Again, the main thing you're going to really be wanting to use your grenade launcher for is, uh, well, mainly for the snatches because, again, as they've been introduced now, they're pretty much going to be your regular enemies and in very inconvenient places like this. And, uh, they'll also sneak up on you because, unlike most enemies that usually tend to make more of a pronounced noise, the snatches usually just tend to sort of, uh, sneak around a little bit. So, uh, again, generally, if you're going to be facing off against them, they'll likely get you before you get them, and, uh, well, to kind of talk about the Bandersnatchers as enemies in and of themselves, yeah, as you could tell with their introductory cutscene, they can reach up to high places, and, uh, unlike other enemies in the game, they can pretty much ascend to new, to new heights, so again, if you're pretty much going up a set of stairs and, you know, there's a platform for them to reach, yeah, they'll use their little Mr. Fantastic stretchy powers to basically just slingshot right up there, so if you think climbing a set of stairs is going to make you safe, it ain't. And they's gonna bandersnatch you! But in any case, it's just, uh, something you gotta watch out for. The bandersnatchers, they do hit hard, but at the same time, they aren't quite something that would be pensioning to the same degree as the Hunters or the Lickers in previous games, so... Again, like, I mean, they're not immediately dangerous, but they do hit hard, and again, you do need to be uh, prepared for them, so... If you want to get them out of your hair, I'd just heartily recommend... Again, as I mentioned before, either the machine pistols, if you still got the ammo for it, or the bow guns, since, again, you have plenty of ammo to spare, and while its uh, damage output isn't really much, the rapid fire more than makes up for that, so, again, sa save your grenade launcher rounds for when you really need them. And by which I mean for the boss encounters, slash, uh, well, a certain enemy that you're actually going to be seeing rather soon. Claire won't have to face it, but, uh, well, uh, no, it's not those zombies, if that's what you're wondering. But, again, you know what, you'll see it when we get there. Also, uh, another bit of trivia, actually, I believe uh, at least some elements of those uh, zombie uniforms were meant to be based on, uh, well, uh, <laughs> the uh, officer uniforms based on uh, Hilda and Hilbert Kruger's father. So, uh, yeah, design elements are very reminiscent of earlier builds of the game. And this is pretty much how you get the code. Make sure you remember this, because it will be on the test, as we zoom on in this stupid sexy skeleton. I really have no idea. By the way, uh, you do kind of also have to get this uh, picture anyway, so uh, we are going to be entering this room and, uh, well, again, that's pretty much the code for opening the door. Uh, people were, ex again, as the Momo explained earlier, people were expected to look through the lens and, like, judge it from that dark room, which, again, like, the, the Memo was basically being sarcastic to the people that worked there that couldn't remember the code, but by that same volition, however, that's a, 
very ridiculous security system. But then again, this is, well, Resident Evil, and as we can tell with a lot of its George Trevor-esque design, yeah, uh, those designs weren't exactly very well, well thought out. At least in some aspects, uh, particularly if you've read, um, well, I, I, can, I can't imagine a lot of people have read it, but uh, basically, well, basically if you read, um, or at least some of the memos from Resident Evil Remake, or something that was bundled with the uh, Sega Saturn version of the game, I believe, or was that, was that a pre-order? Uh, whatever. Basically, uh, it was initially meant to be there for practical jokes, but then Oswald Spencer was like, George, uh, I'm kind of an evil bastard and you have to die. So uh, he basically turned his own genius against him and uh, killed him. Teehee hodl ha. Umbrella Corporation is cartoonishly evil in some aspects, but also kind of deranged and scary in other aspects, so... Whatevers. Uh, but anyway, the only reason we really need to gather that painting is mainly because, again, it will basically... Unlock uh, the half of the puzzle that Claire needs to complete, and the rest will be left up to Chris, because then his contextual items will help us solve that puzzle. I will admit, actually, a very minor thing is that I do kind of miss the one mechanic from Resident Evil 3 where, again, just by pressing forward on the D-pad, uh, Jill could pretty much automatically walk up the stairs without having to press the X button. I mean, again, it's a very minor complaint, but again, just two different development teams having very different ideas on a uh, mechanical refinement, so... Ech. I don't know. Anyway, 1126. It's, uh, isn't that the same combination as the one from Resident Evil 2? Uh, maybe not, I might be misremembering that one. <laughs> now, as you can see, once the game loads, or when I'm loading, yeah, they were doing some experiments with uh, the Albanoid. Uh, it's actually a little document you can actually read up in the uh, computer room, but... Yeah, they were experimenting with salamanders, and uh, let's just say it leads into one of the most annoying boss fights in the game. Uh, what is it with salamanders and being the most powerful and annoying enemies in games, man? Jesus Christ, I mean, seriously, what is it with salamanders and <laughs> being annoying? Like, I mean, first Sonic Adventure 2 and now this. Uh, by the way, you pretty much do have to get out of here quick, although, again, you should have more than enough time to get down to the bottom of the stairs before time runs out. I mean, those uh, smaller albinoids will try and uh, electrocute you, but again, that's simultaneously a prelude to uh, what you're going to be looking for, and at the same time also, well, how kind of pissed they are out of their element. And uh, considering the fact that there's a sauna around there with a large pool of water, yeah, that says pretty much everything you'll need to know about, uh, an upcoming boss fight. But, again, I've said too much. But in the meantime, that's pretty much all she wrote for this area of the military facility. The rest of which is pretty much going to be detailed by Chris, and, uh, let's just say the context of things will be quite different when he gets there. But anyway, now that we have the painting of the super sexy skeleton, we can now return to the room. The room that has a painting that has something behind it. Ugh, that song is just addictive, man. Uh, but in any case, again, when you go back into this room, Steve is obviously gone, and uh, he won't be showing up for quite a while, so if you find Steve's Canadian voice annoying, because you'll only slow him down, well, he won't be around for a while, so just continue spelunking and exploring the world. In the meantime, however, we've still got a large chunk of exploration to go, as well as a bit of a difficult puzzle coming up. Uh, not, not the one we're about to be tackling uh, here in terms of, like, retrieving the painting or anything. I mean in terms of, uh, well, you know what, you'll see when we get there. But it is one that does cause quite a bit of ruckus and fuckus in the minds of many people who play Code Veronica. Um, there is also something I might as well bring up. Again, it is related to the puzzle, actually, but, uh... Again, in terms of the Ashford family butler, yeah, he's uh, usually mentioned a fair bit in the, uh, like, in the case files that you can read up in the game, but he doesn't appear in the flesh. Although he does seem to be a re uh, reference to a lot, and that's because in the initial drafts back when, you know, Hilda and Hilbert Kruger were neo-Nazis, yeah, the butler of the Ashford family was initially meant to have served with their father during the Second World War, so... It seems like he was probably gonna make, like, an in-game appearance, or at least have some degree of, uh, influence over the proceedings, or maybe be, like, a boss fight or something. I don't know. It's, uh, kind of interesting, but I suppose maybe uh, I just dummied him out for the sake of, uh, not being able to fit him in. At least when you get to take a decent look at both of our antagonists here. 
And at last, we have finally reached our destination. Hmm. One of these pictures is not like the other. One is alive, and one is dead. But now the other one's a stupid, sexy skeleton that reveals a secret wall. There is a toy set of an army base, and it needs a piece. But yeah, this is pretty much all we have to do. Now that we have the gold key, we can return to the Ashford Manor, and of course, basically explore the rest of the mansion to our leisure. And again, that's pretty much the training facility that Umbrella trained their troops at. Because every time they want to go training, they need to look at a stupid, sexy skeleton. And look at all its boners. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, anyway, I'm just kind of padding for time here, really. I suppose, um... Will I have enough time to talk about it? Actually, yeah, I will. So, uh, fuck it. You might be, again, given the time frame of three months, uh, three? Three months, Jesus Christ, use your fucking mouth! But again, you might be wondering that given the three month time gap between Code Veronica and Resident Evil, uh, uh th two? Th bleh. You might be wondering that given the time gap, what happened to the likes of, uh, Leon and Sherry? And again, Claire seems to still be in contact with Leon, so, uh, is this meant to take place before Leon joined with the government, or any of that shit that leads into Resident Evil 4? I don't really know, it seems like he's still something of a free agent at this point, but, uh, again, on to more important matters, what exactly happened to Sherry Birkin? And, uh, this seems to have been a bit of an odd duck, at least up until Resident Evil 6. There are certain elements of the, uh, continuity that do kind of lead into it, if somewhat, but, again, I don't know if they're canon, because they are rather obscure things that I think only Japanese audiences got, because, uh... Well, there was like an audio drama named uh, Little Runaway Sherry that basically explores what happened after, you know, her experiences in Resident Evil 2 that it seems to imply that at some point, like, Leon, Claire, and Sherry got separated and uh, as for what happened to Sherry, she pretty much ended up being on the run. Uh, she ran into this uh, other person's backyard, got wrapped up into the cleanup efforts for Raccoon City, and uh, pretty much ended up, well, kind of demonized by a lot of the towns that she tra uh, traveled into and... Well, ostensibly was victimized because of the fact that she was related to William Birkin, who, you know, unleashed the G-Virus and all that. And again, to kind of cut to brass tacks here, it basically got cut short with, uh, Sherry and her friend Meg, I think her name was. Basically being separated on a boat, and uh, the person that was helping them out, I think it was like a Sheriff Allen, I think? Yeah, he basically got bitten and, uh, well, just died trying to save them, so, uh... Again, I don't know whether or not that's canon, or whether or not anything is, uh, at least not what was ref uh, referenced in Resident Evil 6. The point is, uh, Sherry had a hard life. And, uh, yeah, Resident Evil had audio dramas. Anyway, this is the most, uh, well, one of the more difficult puzzles. Not necessarily in terms of what it penalizes you for, but basically, the true successor of the Ashford family. It's congratulating Alfred, who, as we all know, has done such a wonderful job of, uh, well, leading things into this backwater, disgusting place. But again, it is also playing dividends into, well, Veronica. Again, child genius, prodigy, basically the woman who pretty much uh, built the Ashford family from the ground up and, uh, yeah, must have been a real trailblazer for her time, really. But again, this is also talking about a family tradition, uh, basically Ver uh, Veronica bestowing a set of teacups upon her children. And again, as we can see here, Hash Alfred Ashford is the true heir of the family, except not. We must reveal the true heir to the legacy of the family. Now basically, it works in a similar fashion to the crow puzzle from Resident Evil 1. Basically, uh, flip all these switches in order and, well, press the button. The way in which you want to do this, it's pretty much uh, Veronica, as you can see there, that's pretty much the obvious one. Then you want to go with the man with the two twins. Uh, the one right after it is the redhead man with the teacup. Uh, after that, it's the redhead man with the plate. Uh, then after that, it's the uh, the old man right next to him uh, with the earthen vase. And then it's Alexander Ashford with the candlestick. And then, of course, you uh, press the young Alfred Ashford's button. And then the true legacy will be revealed. Again, the only real slip-off of this puzzle, at least in terms of where things tend to get tricky, is picking between the, go uh, the one with the plate and the one with the teacup. But again, it's uh, pretty much, you know... A uh, redhead man with a teacup, then the redhead man with the plate. Again, they're pretty much the grown-up variants of the two twins that you saw beforehand, so, uh... Again, just remember, redhead man with a the teacup, then redhead man with the, well, uh, plate. But again, if... It, it's really not that difficult a puzzle, it just takes a bit of finagling around and, uh... Can just 
I run a bit of tedium, but again, what is this? The true heir of the legacy is revealed, and it is not Ashford, but instead... Alexia. She is the one who will lead us to victory. So let's just uh, raid their grandfather's earthen vase and see what lies beneath. And now again, you might be wondering what exactly has happened to Alexia, because while we have seen a fair amount of her kooky brother and his spooky antics, yeah, we haven't quite seen Alexia running around this place. Wonder why that is? And there's a bug! Ew! Well, we'll pretty much be finding out what happened to Alexia in the next part, because, well, let's just say this game takes quite a few cues from a uh, certain popular Alfred Hitchcock movie, and uh, the results are quite, quite maddening. Uh, but again, you pretty much also need to get a Silvercrest key to access the rest of the mansion, and uh, it's pretty much all she wrote. But in the meantime, I think it's about time we took a save of the game and uh, decided to chillax for a little bit, because uh, we've been up in arms. Fighting zombies, uh, trying to get him out of our hair. I think Claire needs to rest and uh, recuperate her supplies a little bit. And uh, thankfully, you know, you do have enough room to maneuver around, so I wouldn't really recommend wasting your ammo unless they're directly in your path, in which case their cause of death was got in my way. Uh, but again, just so, just so long as they're not your not an immediate threat, just don't really bother with the zombies. Like, I mean, your ammo can be put to far better use. You're back. Welcome home, Claire. I was also very worried about you. Here. Rest here for now. And on that note, I am Solidus Scully. Keep it within the confines of the music genre new Metal, and I will see you next time in the Code Veronica commentary. Goodbye.